Hello and welcome to your lecture. In this video, we're going to talk about the dimension of health that we call spiritual health. First of all, I think it is really important that we understand the concept of this word. So let's talk about what it is not and where I feel that it often gets misconstrued. Spirituality is not just about death and dying. It's not a religion. It is not the worship of the deity. It is not dogmatic nor doctrine oriented. It is not community based. It is not existing without boundaries. And it is not being submissed, oppressed, or subdued. Okay, so then what is it? Spirituality or living a spiritual life, being on a spiritual journey is a journey and a path of authenticity, sovereignty, self-empowerment, divinity. It is consciously living. The true, I feel that it is the true foundation of all areas of well-being. I feel that your health, your state of wholeness and balance is here. If you have template distortions in your soul or your spirit it's more of a soul thing where we would find distortions they will manifest in your life so that you have an ability to see them spirituality is loving yourself radically it's striving to be the broadest and best version of you it's life and living it's being in our personal integrity integrity is not a social construct if you ask me that's morality those are bounds and rules based around uh, what other people may deem as necessary and true within their construct of their integrity, which comes from a completely different place. And we can go into that maybe in a different video. It's really spirituality is being able to divine or funnel life force energy through us. And then what we do with it. Well, how do we use it? Where do we focus it? What do we create with it? It's energy mastery. It's like being given the keys to your car and it not being the first time you've driven. It takes practice as you learn to hold this energy, this energy of what I would call your higher self the biggest volume of universe juice that you can hold within your physical vehicle. It may include death and dying and transformation, but it's so much bigger than that. It's the entire journey. So being present within your life each step of the way, that's, that's conscious living. It's emerged between your humanity, the animal part of us, and our divinity, the spiritual aspect of us, spirit, cosmic fire. Spirituality lies under a blanket or umbrella. I would say it's on a spectrum. Personally, I don't feel that it is in our best interest to look at spiritual constructs in a hierarchical or ladder form, I think it's best when we look at things on a spectrum. So we tip the ladder on its side and see where we're at on the continuum. 
I feel that the quantum field, when we talk about quantum physics and the explorations of the constructs of the universe, that's the umbrella. That's the bigness of it. And then what we do, this mer that's like a merge of science, bringing it into our existence and our life. That's where spirituality comes in, where we're starting to pull that information from the universe into our real life and to our world. And then religion, these tend to be constructs of boxes and more tribal, dogmatic and doctrine oriented things that uh, may be put in place to learn about the mysteries of the universe. At least that's how I feel. I think by design, that religion's goal was to attempt to deliver mechanism to the mysteries of things we didn't understand. I don't feel that it has to be separate from science. I think they both have their beauty because science within itself has the ability to explore those mechanisms. I also feel that with, in regard to religion, it's a very different outcome if you already have ways to come into your divinity or into alignment with your spiritual part of yourself, bring that into your body and your soul and your mind, and then share it rather than <clears throat> if you go into the religion to find that part of yourself, neither is wrong it will just be a different outcome. So I think there needs to be the recognition. These are quantum concepts. So these are big things that I feel like all spiritual paths may recognize as well as religions. So the law of oneness, we're all trying to connect with the energy flow of the universe, connect with that one mind. <clears throat> The law of energy, this recognizes physics, that we are now understanding that matter is energy. It is giving off signals as well as receiving signals all the time, may not be classified as alive, but that doesn't mean that it isn't moving, vibrating, or sending out information about its construct. The law of action is needing to take steps towards what you say you want. So you can't manifest something out of thin air if you aren't taking some type of real-time action, intending that to happen. The law of correspondence, this says that what you think and feel in your consciousness and subconscious is what you create on the outside. The subconscious mind for a lot of people manifests a lot more than the conscious until we bring the subconscious into our awareness. That is say, you know, investigating our own patterns. And I want to say here, let me interject this, that really being spiritual is being conscious. It is kind of observing yourself, observing your actions, observing the patterns. It's making observations of what is in front of you. There's the law of cause and effect. This is related potentially to the concepts of karma and dharma. And those are um, probably mostly linked to Eastern religious constructs or spiritual constructs. Now the law of karma, karma is not an embodiment, meaning karma in and of itself doesn't come back for vengeance. It is what I would call the karmic boomerang. Meaning if you take action from a space of unconscious thought 
feeling or behavior, you're going to, it's, it's the return on the investment. You will create more of what you're act from the space that you're acting from. If, however, you have done some very deep inner work with consciousness, with spirit, you get to alchemize the shadows and then act from a more purified space. When you do this, the product of your actions will be vastly different and highly synergistic. So karma keeps us in a separated state, meaning not whole, not healthy. Whereas once we do some inner work and it takes a while and it's a never ending process, the, again, the product of what you're doing is vastly different. There's the law of compensation, and this is really just more of cause and effect. The law of attraction, you may have heard this again, probably similar or can be uh, extrapolated from cause and effect. In the law of attraction, we say that like attracts like, so this isn't the law of magnetism. That's a little bit different. The law of perpetual transmutation of energy. I love this one. Energy is always moving. And we get to choose whether we go with the flow or we don't. Do we resist the change? This is change. This is the principle really of change. Are you going to change? Is it going to change? Do you want it to change? You have to take correspondent action. Now, when we talk energetic transmutation, we can absolutely relate this law to physics, chemistry, and biology. So a lot of these mates might seem abstract, but you can see evidence in them or of them as you walk through your life. The law of relativity, everything in the universe is just there. And that is what the law of relativity means. It's just plopped there and it may take you witnessing it. Okay. For, you know, light to be brought to it. When we witness something, witness, observe the pattern, we ha then have the ability to bring a, the flashlight of consciousness or spirit to whatever we're looking at. The law of polarity and gender, I'm going to say they're relatively similar. Polarity, one of my favorite things to talk about as well. It is understanding the difference in the relationship between positive and negatives. This is, does not only apply to thoughts. This applies to absolutely everything. In order for us to identify the sun or the day, there has to be a contrast to it. That would be polarity. Also within the law of polarity, when you have extremes, when they come together, that is a highly creative energy, highly creative. So having extremes, pulling them into neutrality, that would be like the ebb and the flow kind of neutrality is where you get to do the creation. The law of rhythm, everything has a rhythm that it will beat to. The rhythms will manifest as patterns or cycles in life. So again, a little bit of ebb and flow thing. The law of gender. This is, again, this is more polarity stuff. Yin yang, withdrawn or active, you know, cold and dark, dry and sunny. Clearly masculine, feminine energies. When I util utilize the word masculine and feminine, it has nothing to do with gender, body, sexual orientation, or gender orientation. This has to do with the polarities housed within each and every one of us, regardless of the other things. We all have both. When we have them balanced, we can do a lot more creative function when they merge together. So when we talk about being authentic, how do we develop a spiritual practice? This is really us being able to divine our higher self into our lives. Again, that authenticity, the biggest 
amount of us that we can hold. That is integrity and that is personal power. Maintaining sovereignty. I mentioned that word. When we are sovereign, we are true to that cause, the source running through us, not for the performance that others want to see. We understand prayer. I think so. It is a conversation. Usually prayer is the question. Prayer is the asking. It might be a celebratory ritual and devotion to a deity. Generally, uh, when we pray, this is the asking part. I wonder why. Can you please help me? It's the invitation. Prayer is the invitation. Uh, Meditation is the sitting still part when we're waiting to receive you need both you need to again this would be evidence of law of gender or polarity you have one thing that's actually actively seeking truth answers and divination whereas meditation is more of a feminine polarity meaning there's a sit still there's a rest there's a nest there's a waiting and then action This is integrative. When we, when we take the information that we divined or the answers that we received or the evidence of the answers that we received, putting it into action towards the highest goal is how we get more consciousness, spirit, authentic parts of ourself within our body, mind, and soul. We connect to ourselves through the invitation of consciousness, through being able to hold. When we invite more of ourselves into our lives, we start to change things. Some tools to help with a spiritual practice. I actually think exercise in a, is an amazing way. You can pray and meditate while exercising. This does a lot of things spiritually, but also mentally and emotionally. It's almost like hypnotherapy done by yourself. Clean eating. When we clean up our diets, we raise our frequency. We speed up our frequency, our vibration. We hold a higher light quotient. So eating healthier, cleaner, and whole foods, we become that thing. So a clean eating plan is a perfect way to clean out your spiritual closet and have a good spiritual hygiene or authenticity, authenticity, hygiene regimen, chopping wood and carrying water means the activities of your day. These can be meditative. If you have to do the dishes, make it a ritual or ceremony to tithe to the, your spiritual center to make this action be be synergistic and pull more of you into yourself. We have to realize that we have to balance the quiet time. We have to have the sit still. We have to learn to listen to our own inner Oracle and the voices in our head and not the voices outside of ourselves. If we are truly divining, they will become more light, more positive, more expansive, and things will change. Being in our spiritual center, again, means being authentically who we are. So authenticity is not what we've been taught. And it's actually pretty rare, I feel, because we've been taught to regurgitate information from other people's patterns, not truly create from our authentic space within ourselves. We're often taught to perform and act in accordance and um according to the fears and limits of other people, institutions, uh, et cetera. We've been taught to compare rather than just share with ourselves, be vulnerable and share who we are without the expectation of that needing validation when we share um, and not attempting to have a requirement for us to change in order for someone else to be more comfortable because there's a difference. I feel that we are not... excuse me, taught super well to honor or celebrate the uniqueness and rarity of each one of us, but rather we're taught to do this comparison principle. We oftentimes have been taught to contort our authentic nature and step out to perform for a version of quote unquote love 
that's usually really about attachments and codependency or fear. Oftentimes we attempt to control others for our own comfort. When we are spiritually disconnected, please understand that this will manifest physically and mentally, emotionally. So we're going to have this ease in other areas of our health and well-being when we are not full of our most authentic self. One thing I want to touch upon, and this might stretch your brains really far, okay, reality is built upon multiple truths. We have this real tangible world around us, but each one of us being in our most authentic space has our own individual center of truth. So all of our truths will link together to make the big jigsaw puzzle of the big truth, the capital T truth. When we ask questions or pray, we have an ability to expand our personal truth. This will change beliefs. So let me put this uh, in perspective for you of what I'm saying. When we're five years old, the world we experience is what we think is the entire world until we start growing up or maybe we leave our town. Then we understand that who we were when we were five or who we were when we were yesterday and what we knew when we were, you know, yesterday, it's not less true when we learn more, it's just less of the total truth. So the percentage (laughs) of truth that it held is different, not that it is truth at all. It's definitely part of the construct. And I think that a lot of times when we're sharing with others and they're telling us the truth and we're telling them our truth, there seems to be like, like the, the difference becomes an opposition, which in my perspective should not be. So understand then that our beliefs get based upon the truths we are able to hold and should be flexible and malleable. And we should be able to build additions onto our house constructed of truth as our mind expands. This is bringing in consciousness. Now, when we have a perception. This is really the set of goggles we're wearing. So if we do not have an alchemized soul where we have done inner work, where we have really inspected some of our patterns as we're stepping onto a spiritual path, when we're holding more of ourselves, if we're not looking um, through clean lenses, our belief systems will be changed and how we view the world and reality, the constructs that are here for us will be different. So it might be like, You know, I say the word junk to me, the word junk is endearing due to experiences that I've had. When you hear the word junk, you equate it to trash. So we have this oppositional view really based on a string of letters, but the meaning behind the string of letters, the word junk is vastly different due to our perspective. Mine was full of love and amour, and yours may think that it's a deficit or a lack. So being in power, this is self-empowerment. This is your personal truth and acting from that space as much as you possibly can, which should be all the time. This is when we are the most authentic with ourselves, the world, and can be the biggest power cell, core cell for the things we want to do. If we want to be world changers, we have to be in our authentic space. If we are not, we are faking, we are performing. And that is like really a power loss, not a power serving. When we are in our truth and our integrity and our highest power line, this delivers us. What we create, we can do the smallest action, that chop wood, carry water part. And what we create will be full of truth and will be constructed of strong things. One thing I want to reiterate, we said this previously in a different lecture, what we have to understand is that just because we don't understand something today, that we have not personally experienced doesn't mean that it's not real or true for another person. Doesn't mean that it's wrong. And just because science can't observe or measure something also does not mean it does not exist. It just means it can't be observed or measured yet. 
when we shine the flashlight of consciousness on the monsters in our closet, we realize that maybe they were never monsters and they were just closed. So one thing on a spiritual path, along with the question asking, because questions are crowbars to consciousness, it allows us to inspect the things we thought were monsters within ourselves, within the world. And it, when we are on a spiritual path, this is self inspection. This is sovereign. This isn't blame shaming or guilt, guilting anyone else outside of ourselves or ourselves. Now, this is a progression when we have had emotional or other kinds of abuses and traumas, there will be a progression to the spiritual process, but starting on it can be quite healing and can be quite life-changing when you start filling your life with you. So when you're on a spiritual path, you do start to ask, who are you? This will likely happen when you start seeing repeating patterns. You'll begin to ask the questions and then you'll begin to shift. You'll begin to seek for answers. That's the prayer. That's the question. That's trying to learn more. Also, I feel that when we ask the question, when we ask questions to another person, it is likely us trying to understand another person. And when someone asks us a question, likely it is them trying to expand their consciousness, their spiritual understanding of a different way, a different perspective, a multidimensional approach to being. When we start on this spiritual walk or journey, this walk to authenticity, you're calling more of you into your life and the performance of who you were taught you were begins to decline. You will start to uh, absolve yourself of patterns. It is truly learning the art of forgiveness and has to start with you. This is the journey to what I call the sacred self. When you start this, you're going to blow things up. When you become more of yourself, your mental programming will begin to crumble. When we get depressed, that life is crumbling around us, maybe, because we've called more of our truth in, this is where we're choosing for ourselves. This is an investment in in ourselves. You get forced to be what you've been searching for. You will feel, you might feel crazy if, you know, you're not understood for calling in your truth. Because it's a complete shift in who you are and who, how you're reflecting yourself when you start to do this. You will begin to purge and change. And sometimes this is people. But you cannot change toxicity within you if it's still present around you. So we can talk again about spirituality versus religion. Being spiritual again is being authentic regardless of dogma and doctrine. So you being in your spiritual center and taking it into a religious practice will give a bigger benefit actually to the religion because you're bringing in the truth of who you are. It's being the best you and putting it in whatever box you put it into. You're not compromising your truth and your integrity regardless of title or institution or whatever. Also, when we are in this, we will make better choices. We will make high vibrational choices. There will you know, when we are saying, or if you're afraid of someone being in control of their life, because you think that, you know, that's a threat. That's honestly the opposite of the way that it works. When a person is in their truth and integrity, they're being honest, they're being full, they're in their full power, their high vibration, their choices are going to be higher and lighter, and they will uh, wound people less. We infuse, uh, our spirituality into that spiritual practice. Like I mentioned, religion is largely interpreted and therefore determined by the perception of the deliverer. So when we're talking religion, even um, who we are listening to, we have to be careful that, you know, their message is clear and not brought through their wounds, but us as the receiver as well. A lot of what they are saying will be dependent on where we are in our healing journey. The conscious awareness of the teacher will determine the message and intent, but the conscious awareness of the receiver 
will determine the meaning. So truly there's more on us and how we're able to receive it. So hopefully through the message, it can inspire us to embark on a journey of healing the soul and truly forgiving and letting go of all of the shadows that we've been carrying for way too long. Um, I would say that spirituality is again, more sovereign. It's an individual path to whatever your authentic nature. That's the sovereignty part of it. Whereas religion tends to be more community or tribe based. Neither is wrong, just a way to do it. Okay. I hope this video was helpful and we'll see you in the next one.